look at throughout wow. history, and what you're going to find is that central banks back in the days used to hold close to 75% of their assets in gold. And now we're, you know, we've been through a 30 year period where we've seen them accumulating treasuries and other sovereign debt in, uh, uh, instruments rather than the metal itself. And now we're at the mm -hmm. beginning of this trend reversing. And I think there's a long ways to go. And as we see gold actually breaking out and continuing to break out moving forward, and I think we're going to see stupid levels in terms of gold prices by the end of this decade and so forth. Amidst historical affinity for gold and recent market turbulence, China's increased involvement signals a significant shift in gold trading dynamics. Tavi Costa, a macro strategist from Crescat Capital, notes that central banks' accumulation of gold reflects its status as a credible monetary asset with centuries of history. This trend is expected to persist, potentially driving gold prices to remarkable levels by the decade's end. This year's surprising surge in gold prices puzzled analysts until Chinese retail investors flooded the Shanghai Futures Exchange causing volumes to triple and prices to soar, despite global pressures like rising treasury yields and a strong dollar. With gold reaching all-time highs above $2,400 an ounce, China, the world's largest producer and consumer of gold, plays a prominent role in this extraordinary ascent. Traditionally vying with India for the world's biggest buyer of gold, China surpassed India last year as its jewelry, bars, and coins. Consumption reached record levels. Costa suggests that while gold may lead the price movement, other commodities could see even more significant gains due to their undervaluation. Although gold equities began to perform as expected in March, analysts predict that gold miners will significantly outperform over the next 12 months. This expectation is driven by the anticipation of gold miners finishing 2024 with appreciation well above the movement of the underlying gold price. Despite the bullish outlook for gold and other commodities, Costa sees mining stocks as undervalued, allowing investors to capitalize on their potential growth. Come along as we explore Tavi Costa's valuable insights. Don't miss out on our latest updates. Subscribe to our channel and activate notifications. Thank you for tuning in. And mostly commodities, hard assets can be breaking down. Even, even the housing market participates as, as a hard asset. But the mm -hmm. most asymmetry you can find is likely to be in the commodity space and not even gold. I mean, gold is likely to drive things higher and like to be the, sort of the, the leading of the pack. But what really leads from a price perspective is going to be the other things that are so cheap, such as silver, the miners, platinum, copper, and other things that are is still historically cheap relative to gold itself. Now, what is important here is that what I mentioned in that whole report was something, a concept that I've been thinking a lot about. We know that we're living in a more deglobalized environment than we were back five years ago, but more from a logistics perspective, more from a reshoring perspective. We're seeing countries you know, having to improve their manufacturing capabilities. We're seeing defense spending. We're seeing conflicts we haven't seen in many years. There is also a deglobalization era also being unleashed from a financial standpoint too. And that I mean through what central banks hold in terms of their balance sheets and assets. In terms of you know, the, the need for owning a neutral asset like we haven't seen in many decades, such as gold. Mm. And a neutral asset that has centuries of history uh, in terms of being a credible monetary asset, uh, different than Bitcoin in this case, not to say the Bitcoin will likely uh, also benefit from these trends, but gold is the only one that carries that, uh, that profile. And so we're seeing a large purchases or accumulation of the metal. Uh, that doesn't come as a surprise. The, the more important question is, is this a sticky movement? Are we going to see even more of that accumulation moving forward? Or this is all that we've seen so far is, is actually what we're going to get. And my answer to that is look at throughout history. And what you're going to find is that central banks back in the days used to hold close to 75% of their assets in gold. And now we're, you know, we've been through a 30 year period where we've seen them accumulating treasuries and other sovereign debt in, uh, uh, instruments rather than the metal itself. And now we're at the mm -hmm. beginning of this trend reversing. And I think there's a long ways to go. And as we see gold actually breaking out and continue to break out moving forward, and I think we're going to see stupid levels in terms of gold prices by the end of this decade and so forth. Uh, where you had to see that actually drive other assets that are uh, usually have leverage to gold prices. And that's why I get so 
um, you know, I, I get so uh, uh, I think there's such an opportunity to invest in the mining industry because uh, right. it's been forgotten. And I find it hard to believe we're going to see all these things unleashing without making that industry at least more relevant of what it is currently. D despite the movement we're seeing in gold prices, mostly driven by central banks and why we're seeing this movement. I sort of explained already, but uh, how do we know it's central banks? So we know that because we're not seeing the inflows causing other vehicles like the GLD, which is an ET ETF, most liquid ETF in the US uh, that retail investors tend to buy. We know 6040 portfolios are named 6040s for a reason where investors continue to completely neglect gold and buy treasuries. And you look at even the TLT ETF as a, as a good proxy for fixed income which continues to see more and more inflows despite the prices of the asset being completely uh, vanished in the last uh, two to three years. Now, what is important here in this sense is that central banks don't usually buy the miners. And so you're seeing this lagging effect where gold prices have been rising and the miners are still lagging here. Uh, that to me is the, the, the real opportunity. Costa underscores suppressed credit spreads and the looming risk of a recession, citing indicators like the steepening yield curve as worrisome signals. Research from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York indicates a 58% probability of a U.S. recession before February 2025, a level not seen since the 1980s. Discussing the recent series of rate hikes by the Federal Reserve despite ongoing increases in the monetary base, Costa notes that the central bank's higher for longer stance was unexpected at the beginning of 2024. However, investors must adjust to this reality, with inflation proving stickier than anticipated hovering around 3% compared to the Federal Reserve's 2% target. Recent statements from Fed Chair Jerome Powell and other policymakers solidify the notion that rate cuts are unlikely in the coming months. In fact, there has been discussion about the potential for additional rate hikes if inflation does not ease further, emphasizing the Fed's commitment to tackling inflationary pressures. Let's get back to the interview. You know, I think it's Trenton decays really what we're seeing. We've had a mm -hmm. uh, a series of, of rate hikes recently by the Fed, uh, despite the fact that monetary base is still increasing. I think what's been sort of hiding the, the bearish uh, thesis has been the amount of fiscal stimulus we've had so far. Now, what I think it changes over the next uh, uh, 12 to 24 months or so is, is the fact that, number one, uh, credit spreads are completely suppressed right now. So basically, we're living in a world where people are starting to uh, at least agree that interest rates are going to be higher for longer, or at least these mm -hmm. levels of interest rates that we're seeing in the long end, short end, and so forth. But we're not seeing that repricing happening in terms to risk. Um, so either we're going to go back to a disinflationary era, which I don't believe at all, uh, or uh, risk needs to be or is perceived too low and it's completely mispriced. So if you look at things like credit spreads, which is basically measuring the difference between risk-free rates and also corporate bond yields and so forth, you can see that those spreads are very low today, one of the lowest levels since 1995 in one of the charts that I had recently. And mm -hmm. that measurement alone is it actually happens every time uh, you see the suppression of 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 those of those spreads during periods of that hiking cycle. Uh, now we're kind of at the end of that situation. We went from you know people expecting seven rate high, uh, cuts recently to now less than two uh, for the next uh, twelve months or so. And I think people are underestimating the risk of a recession. And lastly. I would point out what's happening with the yield curve. The yield curve is starting to steepen significantly what we're seeing uh, now. Uh, and, and that usually coincides with the recession too. So if anything, I think things have really straightened up the the, the case for a, a hard lending and uh, mm -hmm. having the sentiment shift so uh, so uh, drastically uh, speaking across most market participants, I would say that that's more of a worry uh, and not something I would be uh, you know, really uh, supporting my bullish thesis on. Um, wow. I was referring to a hard lending that ultimately drives multiples to be compressed and ultimately then will then uh, cause the kind of economic contraction. One thing the IMF is also talking about that I think it's even uh, potentially more relevant has to do with the sort of uh, dilemma, fiscal dilemma that the U.S. is facing. And they've been calling it sort of a dangerous path, fiscally speaking, in the U.S., where mm -hmm. we're seeing more and more uh, fiscal stimulus at a time when unemployment rates are so low, we're seeing an economy that is growing uh, somewhat normal, um, and there's no reason to see this level of spending outside of the political reasons of elections coming and so forth. 
And right. the implications of this is, is having on the inflation front. I mean, we're basically feeding a structural inflationary problem. For, there's many inflationary uh, structural pillars, in my opinion, but one of the main ones is reckless fiscal spending. You know, outside of the chronic underinvestments in uh, natural resources, what you have in terms of deglobalization occurring, um, and even the labor markets when people are starting to demand higher wages and salaries, all those are inflationary trends themselves. But then on top mm -hmm. of it, you add how much of the reckless fiscal spending we're seeing in the U.S., it certainly adds to the case of inflation. I think the big opportunity or the big uh, a high probability of, of a scenario here is actually more of a stagflation where inflation is stays sticky and even reaccelerates in some parts of the market. And then on top of it, you also have a deceleration of growth that ultimately drives um, you know, the Fed and also drives even uh, a contraction of the economy over time too. So I'm quite concerned about those things. And I think that there is a chronic problem happening as well with the treasury markets. Um, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the movement of central banks uh, and, and the selling of, of, of treasuries recently, which it hasn't been driven by central banks, believe it or not. Um, but it's, that's what really concerns me is the fact that we're yet to see central banks just start selling treasuries. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a real problem. And more and more, we're seeing U.S. banks. I mean, if you look at lending, for instance, in the U.S. economy, lending has gone sideways. We're not seeing commercial and industrial loans grow because the banks are actually having to buy what? They're having to buy treasuries. They're lending yeah. money to the government. The recent days have seen a stabilization in the gold market, with Thursday continuing this trend. Despite the stability, the market remains characterized by bullish sentiment, albeit with the expected volatility. What factors do you believe will continue to drive the price movement in the gold market? Share your perspective in the comments below. If the video resonates with you, join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications with the bell icon. Thank you for being a part of our community.